The Senate Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Mr. Secretary, please call roll. Vice Chair Orenshaw? Here. Senator Goykachia? Here. Senator Daly? Here. Senator Krasner? Here. Chair Flores? Present. Please let the record reflect all members are present. We have a quorum. Good afternoon. Welcome to the hardworking Committee on Government Affairs. Uh, we have four items on the agenda for today. We're going to take them in the order they appear. Uh, starting off with Senate Bill 105, followed by Senate Bill 185, and then lastly, Senate Bill 186. Um, in the interest of time and, and hoping to provide some guidance to everyone wishing to testify today, namely in our third bill presentation, which is Senate Bill 186, it's invoked a lot of passion, and I sincerely appreciate the amount of uh, Nevadans who have engaged in the conversation, whether it be on phone, email, and or who are present today. I want your voices to be heard, but I also want to be very transparent on how we, we're going to run the meeting for purposes of efficiency and fairness. Um, we're going to provide 30 minutes of testimony uninterrupted. In other words, what I mean by that is if you are in support and you come up and speak for 30 minutes straight, I'm not going to stop you. Unfortunately, if there's 100 other people that also wanted to get on the record, you're going to take up their time. So I encourage you in the interest of allowing everybody to speak that you keep your remarks brief. Second, if somebody's already said something that you agree with, you can always say, I am here in support, opposition, or neutral for the reasons that were just previously stated, and I want my name to be on the record. Uh, feel free to do that. Don't uh, feel obligated to re repeat testimony that's already been put on the record. Uh, the other reason I'm doing this is because I understand uh, that we have some subject matter experts, and I want to give them an opportunity to engage in this conversation should they need three minutes rather than two. Uh, that's why I'm doing it this way. Uh, we'll have uh, the bill presentation followed by questions, and then we'll have support, opposition, and then neutral, and I'm going to follow that uh, pattern with all our bill presentations. In addition to that, I want to remind folks to please silence your cell phones. Uh, this is always a reminder to myself to do the same. Uh, please state your name for the record after each question. And please provide your card and or just on a piece of paper your information to our committee staff so that they have uh, your contact information should we need to correct something for the record, get a hold of you later, and or just so that we can properly have your information recorded for purposes of support opposition and neutral. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to open up the hearing on Senate Bill 105, which revises provisions relating to the Department of Corrections. Good afternoon, Senator, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and committee. We appreciate you taking the time to hear SB 105. Um, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I represent Senate District 9 in Southern Nevada. And Senate Bill 105 is based on a recommendation from the Joint Standing Interim Committee on Judiciary. During hearings held last summer, the committee learned of some issues discovered within Nevada's Department of Corrections, the NDOC, which were uncovered by an executive branch audit conducted by the Division of Internal Audits of the Office of Finance, Office of the Governor. In other words, a government audit. As you know, the Nevada Constitution confers authority over regulatory measures to the legislature to review, modify, or veto administrative regulations adopted under Chapter 233B, better known as the Nevada Administrative Procedures Act of the Nevada Revised Statutes. To ensure proposed regulations are consistent with statutory authority and carry out legislative intent. The audit concluded that the Nevada Department of Corrections should comply with the Nevada Administrative Procedure Act and highlighted two specific problem areas. One, the offender's store fund markup limits, and two, the prisoner's personal property fund. The auditors determined that developing offenders' store fund markup limits and incorporating methodology into legislatively approved regulations adopted through the public rulemaking process will help determine deductions to defray other operations and maintenance costs and ensure that offenders can purchase items at a reasonable cost. In addition, the audit found that increasing oversight of the PPPF, the Prisoner's Personal Property Fund, by adopting regulations um, <clears throat> through the public administrative rulemaking process and determining a reasonable medical copay to charge offenders will do, one, do numerous things. Number one, comply with statutes requiring adoption of regulations. Two, include members of public in the process. Three, increase transparency in the PPPF operations. And four, ensure assessments charged to offenders' accounts are reasonable and conform with statutory authority and legislative intent. Uh, the bill is very short. Well, 
Okay, the important parts of the bill are very short because uh, we have to make conforming changes. So walking through the bill will be very quick, but before I do that, I do want to let you know um, that I am joined by uh, by Jody Hawking, the president and founder of Return Strong, a nonprofit organization based in Nevada that advocates on behalf of uh, people who are incarcerated here as well, and their families. I also have to give a special thanks to the Department of Corrections Director, James Zarenda, who is also present today and will be testifying later. Um, I wish I could say that I had been working very hard on this bill, but the truth is that they have been working very hard on this bill, and um, much like your committee works. and. Um, they may be coming forward with an amendment uh, that it, before a work session, and they may speak to that a little bit today. But suffice to say that uh, I think the most important parties are at the table. The director of the Department of Corrections, Return Strong, uh, members of the legislature, other advocacy groups are at the table trying to figure out the best possible way to structure um, a, a bill that provides for oversight, as pointed out by the auditors in the most recent audit sorry, the oversight that's needed that was pointed out by the most recent audit. Um, we don't have an amendment in front of you today, and perhaps the negotiation will be that we, uh, you know, run with the bill as is. But um, I wanted to make you aware of that before we got into testimony, and now I will walk through the sections of the bill. Um, in Section 1, the bill removes the Nevada Department of Corrections from the list of agencies that are exempt from the Nevada Procedures Act. And then Section 4 provides that the regulations currently adopted by the department remain in effect until they are replaced by the new regulations. And um, if you'll allow me, Chair, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Hawking. She said, oh, me and the microphone. Um, my name is Jody Hacking. I am the founder and executive director of Return Strong. And um, as has been previously said, we are an advocacy group that works directly with Im impacted people, so people who are incarcerated and people and families of the incarcerated. Um, this bill is very important. Well, we have a... <laughs> Um, strong working relationship with Director Zarenda, and I believe that um, I'm hoping that we can kind of come to some agreements of ways that this can move forward that will work best for um, people who are impacted to have a voice in how policies happen. The reason that we really even came into an existence started with when the restitution deductions happened and they happened without really that public process. And so what has been happening for the past several years is that the public process has been f allowed behind the implementation of like AR changes. And so it was the deductions which we woke up to, you know, if you deposited money in your loved one's account, you woke up the next morning and it was gone. So, and then, the mail revisions and like different things that should have had a public process, there wasn't any and they happened and we had to create an outcry in the public and use the media and every other way to be able to try to get those things addressed. And so um, this, it was a welcome change to allow that public process to happen in advance of changes so that we can look at data and research and impact prior to um, administrative regulations being changed that impact people. And then I, some of you may have been on the receiving ends of my emails over the past few years as being like, somebody please help us because we were really um, struggling as a community. And so that is. <laughs> I, I think that covers it. Um, we are happy to take any questions. <laughs> Senator Daly, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good to see you again, Senator. Uh, she had she had a bill in commerce this morning, so <clears throat> I'm always in support whenever an agency is going to go back under the Administrative Procedure Act for regulations, and the way I uh, read this. Uh, from where you were, that they were exempted completely, except for two sections in the law, uh, which now are being removed because they're removed from the entire exemption. Uh, but then I think it's uh, subsection seven and section one, 
uh, Department of Corrections uh, is subject uh, for adopting regulations, but still exempt uh, for contested cases. So we, obviously you were exempt for contested cases before. You want to stay exempt, and I don't maybe know all of the procedures and various things in the Department of Corrections and what type of contested cases we're talking about, and that may very well be the way um, that it should be done. So what is the procedure that they do use uh, if they're not using the Administrative Procedure Act? Uh, and if that's been working, then maybe we're good. But I, and we probably are. I just want to know some of the procedures. Um, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, when you say the procedures, you mean for contested cases? Um, it was my understanding well, that... What do, what do they do? What do they do now? They, they were exempted completely for, from it before, and they're going to continue to be exempted for adjudication of contested cases. So what is the procedure that they need, and what type of cases are we talking about? That is an excellent question, Senator Daly, and I may have to follow up with you on that answer. I think that it is fairly standard um, not to subject contested cases to the Administrator's Procedure Administrative Procedures Act, but um, I will confer with legal and get back to you. Follow, please. And a lot of agencies and various things use the Administrative Procedure Act for contested cases. There's a whole section on it, right? So you have sections on adopting regulations, temporary regulations, emergency regulations. So you have all of those sections. But then there's a provision in there for contested cases. I was just curious what the Department of Corrections uses to adjudicate the cases. So yeah, you can get back to me on that unless somebody's here to answer that. Um, and then uh, I'm assuming their answer is going to be is that the nature of some of their cases and confidential information, possibly various things, you know, means that they shouldn't. So I'm sure they have a process to adjust these cases. I just don't know what they are. But a lot of uh, agencies, labor commissioner, several others, uh, contractors board, uh, the ones that I'm familiar with, use the 233B contested cases provisions to, for those types of things. Members, any additional questions? Vice Chair, please. Thank you, Chair. And Phil Dodge, not so much of a question, but I uh, had the opportunity of meeting Ms. Hawking. Um, actually, shared an Uber <laughs> the other day <laughs> up to Reno, and I couldn't get it a ride, and really got to learn a lot about the organization, and I'm so impressed by everything you're doing, trying to help folks land back on their feet who have, you know, are at Nevada Department of Corrections and trying to make sure that uh, that when they do return to the community, they try to land on their feet. And thank you, Senator Scheibel, for presenting the bills. Thank you for your indulgence, Chair. And I think we're good on questions for now. Um, so if you could uh, please sit back and at this point we'll invite those wishing to testify in support of senate bill 105 anybody in carson city and also if there's anybody in las vegas wishing to testify in support of senate bill 105 feel free to move forward and occupy the three seats good afternoon welcome whoever wishes to go first Good afternoon, Chair, committee members. My name is Nick Shepak, N-I-C-K-S-H-E-P-A-C-K. -E I am the State Deputy Director of the Fines and Fees Justice Center. We are here in strong support of this legislation. I first want to thank Senator Scheibel, as well as uh, Director Zuenda. Director Zuenda has been amazing to work with since he has retaken uh, his post. We are in constant communication and he's always presenting ways that we can reach these types of goals. However, much like me in this position, you all in your positions, and the director in his, he will not be around forever. And what the last four years taught us is that without oversight and public opinion, the damage that can be done to people who are currently incarcerated and their families is immense. Overnight, as mentioned, we saw 80% of money drawn from people's accounts and 80% of every deposit that is placed on an account taken away. We have seen commissary prices rise since 2017 by over 40% because there is no public input on any of this. 
we have seen visitation changes. We have seen changes to how disciplinary and solitary confinement is handled. And the only place to talk about this for the public, for the families, is at Board of Prison Commissioners meetings. And while I have a deep respect for that body, that board is made up of three very busy individuals who do not meet very often, and public comment is often not allowed by phone and only after the meeting has completed. Oversight like this will lead to better regulations, to more input, and to a prison system that doesn't require us to come back here every two years and try to regulate over and over again because we will be taking care of it through a process that almost every other agency and department is regulated by. Uh, we ask that you support this legislation and we will let you know if we come to any agreements with the director on another way that is equally, uh, that will work equally as well to achieve this goal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Lilith Barron, L-I-L-I-T-H, B-A-R-A-N, and I'm the policy manager for the ACLU of Nevada. I also would like to extend our gratitude for the way in which families, those who are incarcerated, legislators, the director of the Department of Corrections, and citizens have worked together to put together a common sense piece of legislation that could have saved the ACLU of Nevada a lot of time. We get thousands of letters uh, that could have been avoided of people suffering that um, greatly need to be in our care and cared by by the state. Um, and we, we really support this legislation. And again, um, we cannot put these people into our custody and not have oversight over their care. You know, lives are lost, families are impoverished further, and the pipeline to prison becomes ever flowing. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Do we have anybody else wishing to join us for Senate Bill 105? Seeing none, uh, BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us over the phone? Senate Bill 105. If you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 105, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. If the public line is open and working, there are no callers at this time. Thank you, BPS. We'll stay with you. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition over the phone for Senate Bill 105? Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Anybody in Carson City or Las Vegas? Seeing none, lastly, we'll move to those wishing to testify in the neutral position for Senate Bill 105. Carson City or Las Vegas. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Flores and the members of the committee. Uh, my name is James Renda. I'm the director for the Nevada Department of Corrections. I'm here testifying in neutral today just to let the uh, committee know that I will be continue to work with uh, the public interest groups that are involved in this process with this uh, Senate Bill 105. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to come up with some solutions. Uh, I did make some recommendations that didn't sound like it went too well, but I do believe we'll get there. And thank you. Senator Daly, please. He gave me the luck. I'm, I'm just, so can you answer the contested cases portion of it? Happy that you're going back into the regulations. Support that 100%. But the contested cases, and I was just looking up the definition of it, I'm not sure you'll have many because it involves uh, giving a penalty, uh, an administrative penalty. So I don't know that you have many of them anyway. So. Uh, James Arenda, for the record. So my... Uh, First uh, three years that I did as director for the Nevada Department of Corrections, we did not have any contested cases. Um, but the process for it, yes, about what the whole process was. Um, and on my end, uh, when we're talking about public oversight or public review or public input, 
Um, I'm very transparent on what I do in the department, and I literally have no problem, and I mentioned this uh, to those that were in the public interest group, whether this bill goes forward or not, I still th I have no problem with adding the public piece into our AR reviews. Um, our, it's under our AR 100, uh, 101, which is our review process and how this works even with the contested. Um, we, we submit it to the subject matter, matter experts, the Attorney General's office. I have no problem with even submitting if we have some type of a way that we could uh, develop a public review committee, um, giving them the opportunity to look at the regulations that are not part of the confidential directives that we have, which is our uh, AR 500 series, which also uh, is uh, considered under security, uh, um, isn't brought up uh, through even the courts uh, because of the security issues related to 500. But all the other ones, if there's a way that uh, I could develop a process to have a public review of uh, two weeks to review every uh, AR that comes my way, and they could review it before I get it, before it goes to the Board of Prisons, um, I think that will help with having some oversight for that the, uh, the public can actually have input. So the, the AR is, is, AR is what? Uh, James Renner for the record. So AR stands for the administrative regulation, which is different from a business regulation. ARs are policies and procedures for the department. And all policy and procedures that the department go through, it's, uh, I, I don't make the, the policy changes, I make the recommendations for the changes. And then it goes in front of the uh, Board of Prisons, which is the Governor, Attorney General, and Secretary of State. They're the ones that approve the changes. So when you talk about the opposition of the changes, um, uh, there is a part there in the testimonies uh, right after, uh, like they mentioned, right after the Board of Prisons, that the public can give their voice of opinion on regulations that they think are, uh, they're, they're not in support of. Um, but it's ultimately, it's the Governor and Secretary of State and the uh, Attorney General that say yes or no on the, and then if there is one being contested at the time, the Board of Prisons can refer it to another hearing. So they could stop the AR from going forward, recommend it to go under further review when there is uh, someone attesting to an AR that's out there. Okay, thank you. And I, I, think, <clears throat> I think we might be talking about uh, two different things as far as contested cases go. Because if you go under the Administrative Proce Procedures Act for the adoption of regulations, or the administrative uh, regulations like you're talking about, so then you have to send out a notice, you have to have a public hearing um, and, or a workshop, and then you would have a hearing, you would adopt the regulation after you've got the input from all of the interested parties and you send out your notice. Then it would come to LCB, LCB would send it to the Legislative Commission, so the governor and the AG and all of those guys would be out. Um, and so you'd have legislative oversight there, with, and I'm gonna agree that that's the way you should do it, and that's what this bill does. Uh, but a contested case would be a different uh, issue altogether. So that would be where I was talking about, like with the Labor Commissioner, where if there was going to be a violation of the rule that they had jurisdiction over, so I'm not sure those contested cases are going to apply to you guys anyway most of the time because I don't think prisoners are coming to you and saying, hey, I, you violated the law, they're going to do a criminal deal. And you don't give them an administrative penalty. There's not anybody you really have jurisdiction over. And that's what the contested case part covers. So, and that's why I'm just trying to make sure I'm using the right terminology for what you're at. The administrative regulation should be under 233B for the adoption of regulations. And that part of it I support. So, so James Render, for the record, that's, uh, you're right, that's where the confusion is. These are our administrative regulations are different from business regulations. Our regulations are the policies that, that we follow, whether it's, you know, uh, why, how you wear your uniform, you know, uh, what your uh, appearance of your hygiene has to look like, you're coming into the facility, where you have to report, how you have to report, uh, when visits happen, how long they happen. So they're a little different than business regulations. They're just procedures that staff have to follow and abide by. So it's not done the same. Uh, the offenders can file grievances. When it gets to the step three grievances, at that point when there's no remedy, that's when they could uh, file litigation on cases uh, that they're uh, either against the policy or the policy has not been followed correctly. So it's a different than a business regulation, if that helps.
I, I think I understand, but I, I don't, I'm not seeing the, the, the distinction. You may see it, but I, I kind of see them as the same. And then when I read the definition of a contested case, so when you say if somebody wants to go to court because they think you violated one of your rules, that's not a contested case by definition under this. So uh, that's where I say I think the disconnect comes. Members, any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you for coming up. Anybody else wishing to testify in neutral for Senate Bill 105? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody on the phone? If you'd like to testify in neutral for Senate Bill 105, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, Senator Shavo, any closing remarks? Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and thank you, Senator, and we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 105. And I look forward to that ongoing conversation. Let us know if we can help with anything. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, next, we have Senator Neal presenting Senate Bill 185, which uh, establishes provisions relating to businesses. Welcome to the committee. Whenever you're ready, Senator. All right, good afternoon, uh, Senate Government Affairs. I am Senator Dina Neal. I'm here to present SB 185. Um, SB 185 is, in essence, um, I would say a bill that's a long time coming. I have considered trying to do in what this is called as an economic opportunity business unit, or in short, a supplier diversity program, probably since I entered into this building. Um, I didn't find the time to do it until 21, and then um, it didn't make it out, and so I'm bringing it back with a slightly different uh, flair and change. Um, last session when I brought the bill, I had it housed under GOED. This time I have it housed under the Division of Purchasing because it makes more sense for it to be under purchasing. So um, the bill speaks to a couple of things, but I want to give a little bit of history because you saw uh, language in the bill that was uh, probably the Clark County Regional Business De De Development Advisory Council, which is called RBDAC, and that's actually been around since 2003. We passed statute um, in the 72 session that actually said that we needed to start uh, collecting data and start doing purchasing and supplier diversity, but it is only applied to local jurisdictions. Um, you should have in your exhibits a report, which was their latest report, which was January 2023, that actually lists all of the political subdivisions and entities that have been a part of the Regional Business Advisory Council, RBDAC in short. And so what this bill does is a few things. It connects RBDAC to the state. That's number one. Number two, it brings in micro businesses, um, and then it starts to talk about bundling. In the bill, it says joining, but you know, in LCB world, that in was bundling, but in my world, it really is just bundling. So um, I'll go through the provisions, high level um, pieces of the bill, really quick to kind of lay out. Um, what this bill is doing, so as you see in Section 3, basically it's creating the uh, Business Opportunity Outreach Unit. Um, the purpose is to conduct um, outreach to minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, businesses owned uh, with disabilities, and then local emerging small businesses and micro-businesses. The local emerging small business language is in there because in 2017 we actually passed statute. It was Assemblywoman Bustamante. Adams and she passed um, an emerging small business legislation and what I've been trying to do is not not only just create a statewide program that takes the work that's been going on since 2003 move it forward but close the loop in terms of some of the emerging small business that was already in existence so you guys have probably been familiar in multiple presentations that GoEd has emerging small business so but they also, emerging small business has a higher threshold. Typically, it's a little bit more in, uh, higher employees, 10 or over, and, but their threshold is like 5 million and down. 
And so this bill tries to encapsulate them because I don't like, um, I, I try to limit redundancy. And I wanted to bring them under this because even though you may be a micro business, which could be one to nine and 75 gross, I wanted the emerging small business and what GoEd is doing over at PTAC, which is also in two places. Um, you have a PTAC at BNI, you have a PTAC over at GoEd. I wanted the emerging small business to be in the space. Um, the bill then goes about setting um, what will be collected. And so it lays out on page three pretty much the general um, list of what will be collected as information and data that um, the business opportunity outreach unit will focus on. And then when you turn to page four, it starts to establish um, the reporting, the, um, the annual goals concerning the awarding, and then it lays out the establishing the program to facilitate micro business, and then the word says joining, but really it's bundling. And the reason why I wanted to have the bundling piece in there is because you can have small businesses that sing, as a singular business, they are not eligible. But if you join together, you could get your foot in the door. And so I wanted to create the opportunity for smaller businesses, micro businesses who may um, be looking to try to get their uh, feet in the door for procurement within local government and state government. I wanted them to be able to join together. I mean, it's not always the option, but if you're friends and you know each other, or if you're thinking about your uh, the economic benefit that you're seeking as a business, it might be wise for you to at least get your, um, I would say, your contract resume um, by bundling and walking in the door as a, in, in a joint opportunity. The last, um, on page four, sub H, that I want to draw out for you is that it also says coordinate um, the activities and goals with the business opportunity outreach unit um, with existing programs that happen to be in INCHI, um, INDOT, and then Office of Economic Development, um, and then RBDAC. And the reason why this provision is just trying to, once again, close the loop, I know that in 2013 under um, then Regent Career, who's now Councilman Career, created a supplier diversity program within INCHI, right? And so when I was thinking about this bill, I wanted to make sure that number one, it touched on existing work, that it didn't leave out um, existing processes that were already in place, and that we kind of merged the whole entire system, knowing that those things already exist. Under NDOT, it's a whole different animal, but they have struggled for years with creating, first of all, they have an Office of Civil Rights, they have a DBE program. They have been asked to perform some level of bundling. However, that bundling has sometimes, well, I don't think it's ever happened. So this might be the opportunity in 23 if this bill was out. Um, I put in Office of Economic Development, GOED, because as I said before, they have PTAC. And if you've never gone to the PTAC, I'll just give you a really quick example. And it's one thing that I really like about PTAC, and I think it was, it was doing really, really well under a particular person who then left the state. Um, you could come in, you fill out a form, you say, you know, you have your NAICS code, you lay out your NAICS code, and then you say, like, what particular area interested your that you're in. And so your NAICS code actually delineates the uh, goods, goods and services that you may be interested in. But it gives you an opportunity to look at um, opportunities that may be in San Diego, maybe in Colorado. And so you can kind of pick a jurisdiction that you will then get these emails that come through to you saying, you know, there is a small business opportunity or a business opportunity or procurement opportunity in San Diego that fits your NAICS code. If you're interested, you can apply. And so when you think about that going on at GoEd, and then you think about what I am attempting to create, I'm trying to create an entire supplier diversity system that connects a very robust local activity that's been going on for a really, really long time to state purchasing, who really only focuses on state contracts. And so um, what else? If you go to... Um, section six, it just, well, really not section six, but page six, se section eight, 
it once again just breaks out like the bundling process, which is how they should come together and submit proposals. My biggest um, interest in this bill is a couple of things, not just telling how much how the purchases happen within the demographics, but also educating. Not every business knows how to inter interact with the state system. And so one of the biggest and most important processes in this bill is also the education that should go around or go to the um, economic development opportunity, which could be a procurement opportunity or contract opportunity. One of the things that I heard way long time ago before I brought this bill was that at the College of Southern Nevada, um, like a procurement opportunity will pop up, but they were like, I don't, I don't even know how to do it. I don't know, I don't know step one on what I'm supposed to say, how I'm supposed to write it, what actually would be the verbiage. That's not necessarily giving somebody a competitive advantage, it's giving them a hint. Okay, this is, these are kind of the parameters of what we expect in a procurement. Here is what a typical RFP looks like. So you're not like kind of throwing a dart at the, in, you know, a, a, it's a dart in the dark. And so I wanted to make sure that as well that when it says on page three, we're going to help these businesses. We need to help them get their foot in the door and then basically, you know, have a report, create a system, a dashboard that lays out how these opportunities are being um, spelled out. And as well, I have an amendment. And if you look, um, the amendment just basically uh, remove the words gain understanding because it wasn't clear on exactly what that meant. And so what I put in for add to section three, subsection B3, is that create, assist, provide pathways to micro businesses to bundle and become eligible. And then once again, um, section three, uh, B, create, assist, provide virtual education pathways for bonding, insurance, and local government. Because I wanted to make sure that, you know, COVID helped us in a lot of ways. It allowed us to do all kinds of meetings via Zoom. And that's actually a cost-saving measure because it doesn't cost you anything. And um, maybe it costs you $200 a year for a real Zoom. Um, but ultimately, it's far less than trying to find a meeting room, host a meeting, and plan events around a series of businesses. And then the other part, um, I believe I added in a suggested amendment from one of the members of this committee <laughs> about adding in the responses to the actual RFP. And with that, I'll open myself up for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for walking us through the sections. Um, I'm going to assume Senator Daly wants to kick us off. Thank, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I did talk with uh, Senator Neal uh, about this earlier. And, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at this as there's things that we need to do, uh, and there are catalysts and things that have to happen. Uh, and I talked to you a little bit about the difference between the word equality and equity, and there has to be some forces that move people in a cer certain way to get that equity that we're looking for. So I think that's kind of where we're going. Just a couple of uh, comments. I did suggest that if you're collecting all of the data and you're going to have some type of uh, goal, and I understand goals and difference between quotas, and uh, well, we want to try to have a goal. If we're going to have a goal and we're trying to reach out to people and various things, uh, I did suggest that we would also want to say, all right, we did this, we put out to these people, hey, this opportunity is there. How many responses did you get? So if someone's trying to get their goal um, uh, on that. The other thing that I was thinking of just now is not really more of a question. Maybe you would want to uh, think about this. Uh, would to give this task force or unit uh, the ability to adopt regulations? Because uh, some of the things, what your goals are going to be, I think would be in a regulation. How does a person uh, qualify to be these businesses and how long can they be in, if you will? Um, some of the deals, is there a good faith effort that somebody can make in order to um, to say, hey, I, I tried, I advertised, but no one gave me a bid, right? Um, 
because they have those in, in other programs for like DBE and, and uh, stuff like that. But I don't think that would go in the bill. It would be probably more uh, in a regulation and whoever's doing this. Because over the course of time, they're going to identify some of these things and say, hey, it's not in the bill. What do we do? And then they're going to come up with policies and various things. But uh, so just a thought on the, uh, on the regulation. Because I do know like uh, under the DBE programs, under DOT, um, there's a process where you're no longer qualified to be a DBE if you, you've been in it. But I know some contractors, they game the system. And I know one in particular has been in the DBE program for 30 years. They're not disadvantaged at all. They've built themselves a niche, and everybody uses them, and they, they, they use that because they meet one of the demographics. Uh, and I don't think your goal is that. So it, some regulations might be helpful. So. Senator Neal, for the record. I am very aware of the people who game the system, and I have probably potentially called out an individual that may have been a DBE and then uh, was properly told off about how they were still trying to make their way in the world, and so I left it alone. But I appreciate those comments. But basically, we would be purchasing who would do those regs. That's why I put it a unit inside of purchasing. I felt it was better there instead of uh, go ed. But I think purchasing would be under uh, the regulatory uh, process on how to you know make this all work. They're very talented there. Um, so we'll see. And, and yes, purchasing probably already has regulatory powers uh, under 30, 332A or 333. Uh, so, so maybe it maybe it's covered there. But there, there's some development here. And like I said, you, you got to have a catalyst. You got to have, have a push in order to uh, create those opportunities and get people the equity we're looking for. So. Uh, Senator Krasner, did you have a question? No. Vice. I think we're good. I think we're all anticipating uh, a, no, a longer meeting for another bill. So I think everybody's just getting ready. Um, uh, at this time, I'd like to invite anybody wishing to speak in support of Senate Bill 185. Either Carson City or Las Vegas. I see some folk in Las Vegas. Uh, we'll start with the folk in Las Vegas, and then we'll move down to Carson City. Good afternoon. Shondell Newsom for the record. S-H-A-U-N-D-E-L-L-N-E-W-S-O-M-E. -E -E. I am uh, the chairman of the Nevada Contractors Association, Diverse Contractors Council. Um, good afternoon, Chair Flores and committee members. Thank you, Senator Neal, for introducing uh, and sponsoring this bill. Um, the NCA is in support. And I know um, Glenn Levitt is there as our um, government affairs uh, person, um, but the, uh, the Diverse Contractors Council was consulted and we're in support as well of uh, SB 185 to create a business opportunity outreach unit. Um, our Diverse Contractors Council made up of small and diverse businesses and organization unanimously supports um, the effort to, to help them with um, many of the provisions in this, in this bill. Um, our mission is to elevate diverse contractors within Southern Nevada's construction industry. And um, our vision is to have the most ready, willing, and able diverse contractors in Southern Nevada ready to commit, willing to compete, and able to complete. We welcome the opportunity to discuss any assistance with potential adjustments to SB 185 as the hearings continue. Senator Neal, I love the idea of small and minority firms joining forces on contracts to bring value to the project, project or campaign which helps them succeed and sustain for the long term. Thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you all for having us here today. Um, thank you to Senator Neal for the invite. For the record, my name is Jaron Gray, J-A-R-R-O-N, last name G-R-A-Y. I represent the Urban Chamber of Las Vegas as the board chair. I want to offer our support for Senate Bill 185. It represents uh, filling the gap between resources for our small business members, and we understand that is a critical part of what we want to do for our small businesses. I do want to note that we 
offer a program called Contract Connections. Within that program, what we talk about getting um, business owners ready for procurement opportunities such as this. So this program would marry up very well with some of the work that we're already doing. We're looking forward to this bill coming to fruition. I'm going to go ahead and speak it into existence now um, and getting through the different committees and levels and things that it has to go through. But we look forward to partnering with Senator Neal um, and making sure that this is a successful effort for everyone in creating the unit. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Eric Garner for the record. Okay. <laughs> I'm a small business owner and I'm also the interim director of small business and entrepreneurship development for the College of Southern Nevada. I oversee Envy Grow. I believe Senate Bill 185 will allow small businesses and micro businesses of all types to get the support they need when it comes to submitting proposals and bidding on state and local contracts. I also support SB 185 because Envy Grow clients could benefit from this level of transparency and assistance from the purchasing division. To reiterate, I support SB 185 as a minority business owner and person that owns a small business um, as it will be reassuring to know that the unit with inside the purchasing division that's researching and working with small businesses and micro businesses and helping them to, when it comes to submitting um, bids for state and local contracts. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee for your time and allowing me to speak. And thank you. Is there anybody else in Las Vegas? Is there anybody else in Las Vegas? Please. Yes. Uh, my name is Bishop Derek Remsen. That's D-E-R-E-K. Remsen, R-I-M-S-O-N. And of course, I represent uh, the uh, NAACP as the chair of the uh, Political Action and Social Justice Committee, subcommittee, as well as also the chair of the Black Leadership Collective. And of course, uh, we thank again Senator Neal for drafting and submitting this essential bill for supply and diversity, especially within the uh, minority uh, community and, of course, uh, with these that are minority business owners. And, of course, one of the uh, necessary things is that we've been pushing for as well as minority contractors uh, having opportunity to bid on the state and local contracts. So we are in support of this bill and we're speaking it as one have already stated into existence because it is a bill that is definitely needed. Thank you for your time. And thank you. And I do believe that was the last person in Las Vegas. We'll come to Carson City, whoever wishes to go first, please. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Eileen Pastor on behalf of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. The RTC is in support of SB 185 because we are certainly invested in the success and development of local, small, and diverse businesses. Currently, the RTC's our, uh, resources, involvement, support, and education, or RISE program, um, promotes economic opportunities for local small businesses and local diverse businesses. Additionally, the RTC provides technical support and education to help RISE certified businesses become more competitive in the bidding process. And we thank you for the opportunity to provide support. And thank you. Please. Good afternoon, Chair Flores and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dylan Keith, D-Y-L-A-N-K-E-I-T-H, Assistant Director of Government Affairs for the Vegas Chamber. Uh, as the largest and broadest business-based organization in the state of Nevada, the majority of our membership is made up of small businesses. And on behalf of those businesses, we'd like to thank the uh, sponsor for bringing this important bill forward. We believe if passed, this bill will be great for our Nevada entrepreneurs, creating more jobs, and also supporting the Nevada economy, as we believe small businesses are the backbone of Nevada's economy. We kindly ask for your support on this measure, and thank you for your time. And thank you. Please. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Glenn Levitt, Director of Government Affairs for the Nevada Contractors Association. We represent over 450 contractors, subcontractors, and affiliated industry professionals, primarily in Southern Nevada, and uh, the NCA uh, is in support of SB 185, and I'm going to say your favorite word in the English language, ditto. Appreciate that. <laughs> we'll see if that moves on into the next hearing. Um, with that, uh, I don't know that we have anybody else wishing to testify in support. Uh, BPS, do we have anybody on the phone? 
If you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 185, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And we'll stay on the phone. Anybody wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 185? If you would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 185, three, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. There are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Thank you. Las Vegas or Carson City, anybody wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 185? Seeing none, uh, can we now go to BPS, last time, uh, neutral 185? If you'd like to testify neutral for Senate Bill 185, please press star 9 now. Take your place in the queue. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. And again, anybody wishing to testify neutral here in Las Vegas, excuse me, here in Carson City or Las Vegas, seeing none. Senator, any closing remarks you may have? None. Thank you. And with that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 185. Thank you, Senator, for your work. And lastly, we'll move on to uh, the hearing on Senate Bill 186. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee, Senator Pete Goikichia for the record, representing Senate District 19. And uh, I'm bringing you some familiar faces and some familiar issues, I'm sure. So. Uh, anyway, I have uh, been on both sides of this issue, uh, Senate Bill 186, for the last 20 years. And uh, I know it's not the first time, maybe it's the first time for some of you to hear it, but it's not the first time for me. Uh, I'm just going to open up with a few brief comments, and uh, because I think it probably will, this hearing will run on uh, a little bit before I turn it over to uh, Chase Whittemore and Mark Bassett to actually walk through the bill. Uh, you need to understand first and foremost that the main attraction in Ely at that museum is the rolling stock, the railroad. Uh, although the museum does have two buildings, the freight, freight building and the museum building, uh, really it's the smoke coming out of those locomotives that brings the people down to that particular site. Uh, I believe that in my 20 years of representing White Pine County, and again, like I say, I've been on both sides. There's been uh, a considerable division in the community. And I have to say, over the years, uh, I've been on both sides of it as well. I've, you know, supported the uh, Nevada State Museum on it. And, uh, but I think we've reached a point in Ely where the people have actually got to the point where they think it's time for a change. And it's no fault of museums, the fact that they didn't accomplish some of the things that have been on the agenda for the last 10 years. It's been a funding issue. Uh, even even years there was appropriations, we didn't get it to the ground, whether it was COVID or whatever. But over the last last 10 years, I have to say, we really haven't gained any ground at the museum. It's starting to hamper the facility. And again, you have to understand, this is not Boulder City's Railroad Museum. This, the actual rolling stock and the attraction there is held by the foundation. And we've got the second floor of the depot building, which is a museum. And the freight barn, which I call the wool shed, because I loaded wool there 50 years ago. And uh, we actually, when we were making trains and, and hauling product, products out of, uh, out of Ely, I wish it was there yet today. But the bottom line is that the wool shed, the freight barn, has not changed much in the last 50 years. Lost a little ground, probably. There's a ton of stuff in there that could be put up, needs to be put up, but it's not happening. So I brought the bill, 185, 186. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Woodermore and Mr. Bassett to really walk you through the bill. Yes, uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you, Senator Gary Kachia, um, for bringing this bill. Uh, Chase Woodermore, for the record, representing Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. Thank you, uh, 
Chair Flores for agreeing to hear this, and, and thank you, uh, fellow senators, um, for your time. Uh, he, Senator Goykachia did a good job. I was going to orient you uh, a little bit. Um, if you see here, this is the visitor's guide for White Pine County. And like Senator Goykachia said, this is the visitor attraction in Ely, White Pine County. And Nevada Northern Railway and its rolling stock, like Senator Goykachia said, is the bedrock of that um, tourism attraction. So to, uh, to really familiarize yourself, here's a picture of uh, the facility and the site. Um, let's see if this pointer works. This is the freight barn here, um, the red, red building with the, the very long uh, building there is the freight building. And then the uh, passenger depot is the main building that you uh, see when you walk through the facility at the beginning. This is the entrance to uh, the Nevada Northern Railway National Historic Landmark. It is a National Historic Landmark. Um, you see there the second floor is the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum. That is where the state operates its museum. The bottom floor, the main entrance, you walk in and it's the Nevada Northern Railway foundation's uh, gift shop where they sell tickets for the train. Again, there's a picture of the freight barn. So what does SB 186 do? Uh, SB 186 transfers both the freight barn and the passenger depot to the city of Ely and the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation for no consideration. Uh, just as they were given to the state of Nevada for free over 30 years ago. Here's a quote um, by the museum director, Sean Pitts. This bill proposes to eliminate the state's museum in Ely. This is simply not true. State museum system would not lose its presence in Ely. Instead, SB 186 specifically requires that the city of Ely and the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation to lease the entire second floor of the passenger depot to the Division of Mu Museums at no cost to the state. There would be no short-term or long-term obligations that the Division of Museums would incur. The lease would be at no cost. 99-year lease, we would do it longer, but by statute, we can't. The foundation would pay all the expenses and utilities of operating the passenger depot and the freight depot. The foundation would invest the money into the two buildings to buildings to fix the foundation problems in the passenger depot and rehab the freight barn to create a new indoor museum. The foundation's plan is to turn the freight barn into a Smithsonian affiliate museum. Legislation would give the city of Ely local control and ownership of the entire complex so that the entire complex can realize its full potential to maximize the investment for the state, the local economy, and so visitors can get the best possible experience. And that's what this bill is about. It's about increasing the visitor experience, maximizing that investment. So why support SB 186? Again, SB 186 will increase visitation and tourism to Ely and White Pine County, which will increase room nights, increase economic activity, and drive future revenue to the state and local economy. Why? How? Because SB 186 will allow the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation to invest millions into the freight barn building and create a new Smithsonian affiliate museum and visitor experience. The new, new museum is a perfect investment to, br to bring new and more visitors to the region. Senate Bill 186 is a bipartisan proposal. Um, and the operations and of the foundation and the state museum often clash over upgrades maintenance, operation times, and numerous other issues. These problems have been occurring for decades and are a function of the fact that it's illogical not to have the entire complex under one owner. The Belmont Courthouse is a good example of uh, precedent for transferring a state resource back to local control. The foundation will protect the historical value of these two buildings. Uh, pursuant to this leg legislation, the foundation must pr protect the historical inte integrity. That's section, subsection 2 of section 2 of SB 186. So in that language, it says, include restrictions that protect all historical and recreational value of the real property in a manner consistent with 
or greater than prior practice and guarantee public access to the real property in a manner consistent with or greater than prior practice. Now that language is identical to the Belmont Courthouse uh, language. This bill, SB 121 in 2013, transferred the Belmont Courthouse back from state ownership uh, to Nye County. Um, it passed unanimously in both houses. And an interesting qu quote, which I is very um, key to this, is that the friends of the Belmont, Belmont Courthouse, and we can agree more, the most important stakeholders are those closest to the project. They're the ones that best understand the resource, its place of importance in the local economy, the family histories, and its value to the community. Again, LCB used identical language from, from SB 121 to draft this bill, SB 186. Again, that's subsection two of section two. Can the state currently sell these buildings? Short answer, no. Why? Well, because the original deed transferring these buildings from the original owner, Kennecott, to the city and the foundation was restricted by Kennecott. These deeds are up on Nellis if you want to take a look. This deed restricted the use to the White Pine Historical Railroad Program. This means if the buildings are used for any other purpose, then Ken Kennecott could exercise their reversionary interest, meaning no third party would purchase these buildings subject to that deed restriction. Next, the deeds transferring title from the city of Ely and White Pine Historical Railroad, now the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation of the state, was deed restricted as well. The restriction put in place an unlimited right to perpetually use the buildings for any business of the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. Now that's up on Nellis again, the, the, the three deeds in question. Again, this means that no third party would purchase these buildings with that deed restriction. Additionally, without the foundation, these buildings have no parking and no ingress and egress. So what does some of the opposition say? Well, that this is a hostile takeover. It's really not. We have five elected state senators and two elected state assembly persons sponsoring this legislation. This is not a hostile takeover. This is a process called the legislative session. The director of museums believes that this sets a dangerous precedent. That somehow other state owned museums would be lost in the future. This is wrong. There is no other situation like this. We are unique. For one, this transfer is not to a private entity. This transfer is to both the city of Ely and the foundation, which is a nonprofit charity governed by articles and bylaws. All assets currently owned by the city and the foundation have to be used in furtherance of the foundation's nonprofit mission, which is to preserve, protect, develop, educate, and display the Nevada Northern Railway National Historic Landmark for the public. Second, the foundation and the city of Ely granted these same two buildings, the records and artifacts to the state for free over 30 years ago. This transfer is simply granting these buildings back to the original owners that have a proven track record of preservation. Additionally, the state does not own the buildings free and clear. They are subject to the foundation's broad right of perpetual use. The state's museum in Ely has no parking, no ingress no, or egress except through foundation property. Each building is completely landlocked by foundation property. Therefore, no other museums within Nevada are in a similar situation and have nothing to fear by this legislation. Finally, the foundation has strong financials and has the capability to raise the funds to restore the freight barn and use as a showpiece museum that is a Smithsonian affiliate. The state's vision is for the freight depot to be primarily operated as convention space. And I will turn it over to uh, Mark Bassett, who is the president of Nevada Northern Railway Foundation to run through the rest of the slides. Good afternoon, Chairman Flores and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity. The Nevada Northern Railway Foundation came into being back in 1984. The entire railroad, the copper mine, and the mill and smelter in McGill was built by Kennecott Copper for the production of copper ore there. Uh, the copper mine shut down in 1978 and the community realized its first 
migration of people leaving. In 1983, Kennecott shut down everything. It shut down the mill and smelter in McGill, and it shut down the railroad. When it shut down the, ra uh, shut down the railroad, 20% of the population of White Pine County left. And the people that left there, there was 20% unemployment. The community was scared. They thought they were going to dry up and blow away. There's a great history of that happening here in Nevada. We probably have more, more ghost towns than any other com state in the union. The community went to Kennecott and said, you know what, you no longer need the railroad. Will you give the railroad to us? And Kennecott, oddly enough, said yes. And so they transferred to the community, the city of Ely, at that time we were the White Pine Historical Railroad Foundation, the entire complex, 56 acres with 60 buildings and structures on it, one steam locomotive, 100 antique rail cars, and 30 miles of track. And it was up to us to maintain it and everything else. Well, you can imagine this was pretty scary to the community. It, uh, and since that time, we have managed to do that. And I'm going to slide this over. I can, I... Oh, OK. Uh, well, I can't. All right, however, at the time, the foundation was an infant and it was unsure if it could actually operate the entire complex. And that photograph there shows the entire complex. The foundation in the city of Ely gave two buildings to the state of Nevada without consideration. The intent was to transfer the entire complex to the state of Nevada and have the state of Nevada build a major museum there. In 1993, the state of Nevada backed out and decided against any other transfers of the buildings to the state because of financial difficulties. Today, the East Ely Railroad Museum is a state museum. The state operates the second floor of the East Ely Passenger Depot building as the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum. The foundation operates the first floor of the passenger depot and the rest of the complex. Thus, both the state and the foundation currently operate out of the same building. The second, second building uh, for the state is the freight barn, which is idle more than 330 days out of the year and is only used for special events. The state's East Ely Railroad Depot Museum comprises of a long hall hallway that visitors go to visit in seven offices and furnitures versus uh, the city of Ely and the foundation has uh, the entire complex. And the state has been up there for over 30 years. These office exhibits protected by a barrier and most visitors that take the tour are done in about 10 to 15 minutes. The state has maintained the buildings for the past 30 years, but there's still a need of a minimum of $12 million for critical needs, and that is a minimum. It, uh, the Division of Museums uh, is asking for $7.7 .7 million in a CIP to rehabilitate the freight barn and $821,347 for the depot building's foundation. What hasn't been funded and is not a CIP is three, uh, $2 million for weathering of the depot building and installing HVAC system in the passenger depot. That picture of that thermometer there, the temperature was uh, about 52 degrees on um, and that's the temperature that the staff works at, at, the foundation staff works in. This is a map of the Nevada Northern Railway National Historic Landmark. You can see it's a large complex. There are the 60 buildings and structures there. We've indicated which buildings we have saved from collapse and rehabilitated. It, uh, and it's been quite the process. Okay. 
What does the foundation do? The foundation greets the tourists. Everyone funnels into the depot building and the foundation staff greets them on the ground floor there. We provide a walking map of the complex and explain what there is to see and do. The foundation worked with Senator Reed to obtain national historic landmark status for the complex during the railroad centennial year in 2006. The foundation provides almost all of the marketing, promoting, and advertising for the complex. The foundation operates programs that can only be done in Nevada. And these pro pro programs include the Be the Engineer experience, where we actually allow the public to operate a steam locomotive on a 14-mile round trip. We have Railroad Reality Week. We took a page from Mark Twain the whitewashing of the fence. We literally have people pay us $1,000 to work on the railroad for a week, and we work them very hard. And, uh, and again, the job of the foundation is to bring people to Ely, and Great Basin National Park is a national dark, or an international dark sky park. We started working with Great Basin National Park to offer the Great Basin Star Train. That Star Train is wildly successful and it sells out a year in advance. The foundation has an incredible presence on social media. Last month, the foundation reached over 3 million people. Our Facebook page has 130,000 followers and we have 178,000 people who follow our page. That was 130,000 likes. And the foundation has been very fortunate. We've been featured on CBS Sunday morning. We've been featured on CBS this morning, five minutes on the Great Basin Star Train. We've been featured on Pawn Stars, American Restoration, and the piece de resistance was the Big Bang Theory. They had Sheldon come to the Nevada Northern Railway and operate a steam locomotive. And the great thing about that is they pronounced Ely and Nevada correctly. It, uh, the foundation owns and cares for the priceless steam locomotives, including the official state locomotive, Locomotive 40. Thanks to Senator Pico Cochia, Locomotive 40 is an official Nevada state symbol. Inside the freight, an inside look at the closed freight barn today. In over 20 years, the display cases that were brought over from Carson City have no displays in them. So yes, the freight depot is open periodically for special events, but the display cases are, are empty. Even though we do not own the freight barn, uh, we receive negative comments on feedback on our social media. It, uh, people want to go in there, they don't understand why. In fact, the number one question that we receive is where's the museum? People are used to going to a museum into a building. And this is what our plan is. This is an inside look at the new Smithsonian Affiliate Museum. We would open the freight depot to visitors on a permanent basis. We would be open every day except Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, January 1st and 2nd. The state has not put in a necessary fire suppression system in over 30 years. We would do that. The foundation would bring the building up to code. It would install an HVAC system, fire suppression system, and other important life safety features. The community events would still play, take place in the new museum. Does the foundation have the capacity, the funding, and the experience needed to protect the historic integrity? Short version is yes. Uh, the illustration in the upper right side there, we did it, $498,210. We raised that money from last Thanksgiving to December 31st. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, it is a little small. All right, again, this is Chase Whittemore for the record. Um, so short answer, yes. Uh, this legislation does not change the operations of the State Museum in Ely. Um, the foundation would, wants to keep the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum just as it is, as it is today. 
Um, the foundation has over 6,000 financial contributors who contributed, um, have donated an average of 1,041,000 each year over the last three years. The foundation train rides uh, yield uh, over 755,000 per year in revenue. The foundation has raised and invested over 39 million into the complex over 30 years through a combination of gifts and donations, dues from members, local, state, federal, and private foundation grants, room tax revenue, and operations. Uh, the foundation has over 25 employees, including a curator, curator of education, and archivist. Uh, it has over 125 volunteers. Uh, foundation is overseen by a board of directors. Five are elected by the members of two, and two are elected members of the city of Ely. Um, the city of Ely would be a joint owner, and the public would still have oversight. Um, the foundation closely follows the Secretary of Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties. Uh, foundation was recently awarded its third Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act grant for over $10 million. Uh, these are some of the foundation rehabilitation success stories. The Chiefs in Engineer Building in 2000 versus it is today in 2021. Uh, this is uh, same same pictures going through the uh, support garage before and the bus support garage after the foundation building projects again um, the foundation is responsible for 58 of the buildings and structures and the foundation has saved nine of the structures from collapse and rehabilitated another seven um, the Nevada Northern Railway 2023 budget uh, again you'll see here donations train operations, room tax, income, gift shop, uh, sales, event income, museum emission, lodging income, uh, total income of $2,600,000. Uh, this, this, this legislation has strong local support. Again, the city council approved a resolution supporting SB 186 in a 5 to 0 vote. White Pine Main Street Association has approved supporting SB 186 in a unanimous vote. The White Pine County Chamber of Commerce, support from local bodies, um, unanimous support from the foundation's board of directors. In addition, there's over uh, 350 emails and letters of support up on Nellis, again, uh, from foundation supporters and members of the local, uh, 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 local community. The care of the records and artifacts currently in the freight barn, um, we would work with the state um, in creating a space for the records that are currently there. Um, we want to ho house those artifacts in the freight barn. If the state wants to do so, we would do that. Uh, we would enter into a cooperative agreement with the state to house those, to display them, to store them in the freight barn. They don't need to take them out of Ely or get a new space for those. Um, we have a, a Save America's Treasures grant that will allow installation of modern space saving shelving. Uh, here's Joan Bassett. Uh, she's a curator, uh, BS and MBA. She's a published author, uh, Con Trumbull, and he's an archivist. Bachelor, he has a Bachelor of Science. Here's the online archive. Um, uh, here's a, the stats on the on, online archive. Uh, we're heavily regulated. Um, you see there a host of number of agencies that uh, are that we are re regulated by. Again, uh, we've already listed all the foundation's accomplishments. We can send around to the committee members a, a list of, of all of those. And now, any questions? And thank you for the presentation. Um, at this time, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, Senator Krasner, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation. So um, it's my understanding that the state of Nevada only owns seven museums. Um, this bill wants to transfer one of the seven state of Nevada owned museums to a private foundation for free. Why would this body agree to do that? Thank you. Uh, Chase Whittemore for the record, um, Senator Krasner. Uh, Yes, I, I believe there are seven um, museums uh, that the state museum oversees. Again, this bill uh, does not change the operations of the state museum in Ely. The state 
would uh, still have the second floor of the passenger depot, so they would still be a part of the community there. They would still have a museum, so we are not eliminating the state's museum. The state would still have seven museums um, in Nevada. And Senator Gokichi, if you want to follow up with that. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Gokichi, for the record, to my colleague Senator uh, Krasner. Uh, you have to, if you look at uh, sub four of section two, there is a reversionary clause. If, in fact, they don't do what they say they're going to do, if they don't protect the interest, it does go back. And uh, your question is, why would you give one away? Well, I think any time you can improve something, it's probably an opportunity. Again, they're not giving it away. They're giving the Railroad Foundation the ability to upgrade, improve that facility for White Pine County. I think it's huge. Uh, if, in fact, they fail, there's a reversionary clause. Senator, do you have a follow-up? I'm sorry. My understanding from the bill is that they are transferring the State of Nevada Museum to the foundation, including the 1.8 acres of land it's located on for free. Is that not correct? That I believe that is correct the same way they received it. And, and if I may, um, there are... If Senator, you just please yes, state your name for the record. Please. Sorry. Um, Chase Whittemore for the record. There is currently a need for over $12 million in upgrades in between the two buildings. So to um, really it's, it's not for free. It's actually uh, transferring the liability from the state to the city of Ely and the foundation. It's not to a private entity. It's to the city of Ely and the foundation, which that long-term obligation now, the state um, can use the 9.9 million in CIP or 9.5 million in CIP requested funds for other state projects within the state museum system. So um, it is for no consideration. We're not paying for them, but it's not for free. It comes with a price tag of, um, according to the state's numbers, it's 12 million to upgrade it. Uh, you Please. just said it's for no consideration. That means it's for free, the, the buildings and the 1.8 acres of land. I, Chase, one more for the record. Um, did you want me to answer, or is there a question? I, Senator Krasner? Yeah, there's a question. Is that correct? So, Chase, one more for the record. Again, it would be for no consideration. We're not paying the state for the, for the buildings. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? And, and I think the reason you don't have questions, I think you've had an opportunity to bring up your issues, and we understand what you're trying to do. Whether people agree, that's a different question, but I do appreciate the amount of work you've put in and help. Um, bring about some of these issues and explain to us what you're trying to do. I'm going to invite all three of you to please sit back. Um, and I don't know, Senator Gokichi, if you wanted to join us up here, it's, that's your call. But you can, you can hang out. <laughs> you can hang out back there. Um, so we are going to start the timer. And at this time, I'm going to invite those wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 186. Uh, before I set the timer, I would want to remind folk uh, if somebody's already stated an argument and something that y you believe in, you feel free to just come up and say, I agree with that. Put your name on the record, uh, and that will help the conversation move faster. But we will allocate 30 minutes to each side. Um, with that, uh, we'll start in Carson City, and then uh, every once in a while we'll jump to the phone just in case anybody's joining us there, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Senators. My name is Nathan Robertson. I'm mayor of the city of Ely. I'm a fifth generation Ely resident and the 25th mayor of the state's sixth oldest city. I've been going to this property since before the state owned it. Um, I've been, f I've had a front seat, front row seat to the developments that have taken place there over the years. I appreciate the state's participation in this over the last 30 years. And as was stated in the testimony, I think the city is anxious to make sure that the state's facilities continue on there. But it is evident over the last 35 years that the local community has raised more money and invested more heavily and is more invested in the success of this property than the state has been. Not through any fault of the employees there. Uh, Mr. Pitts, who has been there since the beginning, is an indispensable member of our community. 
and, and a huge asset to our educational institutions and, and to our community as a whole, and we want to make sure he continues on there. But it is evident, and proof is in the pudding, that the community has invested more time and energy in this than the state has been able to. The state has threatened to close this museum twice, and any time there is budget cuts, museum is first on the chopping block. Uh, Mr. Pitts has taken pay cuts to remain on there. He has been dedicated to our community, and I'm grateful for that. And like I said, we want to make sure that continues. But to continue on here and to get the benefit of it, I believe that the community is in the best situation to do that. The city of Ely is not some shadowy separate entity. We are a subdivision of the state of Nevada. I take the same oath that all of you do. I am there to protect and defend the constitution of the state of Nevada and her people as well as that of the United States. It's the same oath. Um, therefore, it's, uh, it's the, the end result is that everybody benefits. It's, it's not a question of making um, divisions in a sandbox and, and um, it, it, it's, it's tiresome to hear those kind of arguments over whose sandbox is getting more money or who's getting what. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody benefits from this. And I think we have a track record of that. Um, I'm here on behalf of the city council who's voted for this. Um, as uh, Senator Gokachi, I've been on both sides of this for many, many years. And I think this is one of the best proposals that I've seen. I think it partners both communities, uh, the state and the city, and, and has the best outcome for all of the citizens of the state of Nevada. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, please. Good afternoon, senators. Uh, my name is uh, John Ginoli. I appear in uh, support of SB 186. Uh, I was born, raised, and continue to live in Ely, Nevada. I want to especially uh, thank uh, Senator Kokachia for sponsoring this bill. Very much appreciate it. Uh, when I first met Senator Kokachia, was in fourth grade, he was Pete to me. So we've had a long-standing relationship. Um, I currently serve as the president and chairman of the board of the First National Bank of Ely. I'm very proud to say that's the oldest bank in the state of Nevada. I also, for the last 20 years, have been on the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. The latter part of that term, I have served as the chairman of the board. My love and appreciation of the railroad goes back to my youth. I remember my mother, Barbara Cahill, Barbara Cahill Ginoli, telling me about the call boys from the railroad coming to her house, to her father's house, Art Cahill, who was the chief mechanical officer. And in those days, they didn't have phones, so what they did is they sent young runners around to knock on the window, say, Art, Art, come to work. Middle of the night didn't matter. So he went to work. So she told me these stories forever. So it's very deeply, deeply seated in my psyche and my love of my community. I think it's definitely the best case to unify this property. I think it would make things much more seamless from a tourism perspective. I think it would be good for everyone, everyone concerned. So I just want to say for me personally, for my family, I've been in Ely forever, uh, this is an extremely important endeavor on our part. We really appreciate your consideration in supporting SB 186. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Stephen Wood, representing the Nevada League of Cities and Municipalities. I'll make it brief. We would like to echo the sentiments brought to you by the mayor of Ely uh, and ditto his comments. And we have submitted a letter from the president of the Nevada League of Cities uh, for the record for this hearing. So please take a look at that letter and we encourage your support of SB 186. Thanks. And thank you. Please welcome. Good afternoon, Senate Government Affairs Committee members. My name is Dr. Jerry Lynn Williams Harper. I'm here representing the Ely City Council as an elected council person and as a board member of the Nevada Northern Railway, Railway Foundation. 
I'm an educator with over 42 years of experience and the last 35 years serving as an academic administration. I have served in every capacity as uh, an educator from an assistant principal to being superintendent of four different school districts. I have a plethora of experiences in my professional life, but it has been a particular honor to serve the citizens of Ely as their elected representative and to see firsthand the incredible job the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation has done and continues to protect, preserve, and display the best kept historic railroad facility in the country, I feel. As an educator for over 40 years, my focus is always developing and executing common sense solutions. Voting yes on SB 186 is a common sense solution. It allows the state's museum in Ely to continue operating rent and cost free at the only location it has ever opened to the public in Ely, the top floor of the passenger depot. SB 186 will allow the foundation to utilize all of its tremendous skill and talent to create an incredible Smithsonian and Affiliate Museum in the freight barn, which will finally allow the historic landmark to realize its full potential. Passage of 186 allows the state to save money. This venture relates beautifully to the mission of educating and preserving for in perpetuity the legacy and foundation of how the real worlds were, are, and continue to be a foundation for this country. I want SB 186 to pass for my community, and make no mistake, my community wants this. We need to believe in and support the wishes of the community in Ely, which is evidenced in the support of 186, and our elected senator, our elected state assemblyman, the Ely City Council, five to zero vote in favor, the mayor, the city of Ely, and the unanimous, unanimous votes of the Chamber of Commerce and Main Street Association. I strongly urge you to please pass SB 186. It is common sense, excuse me, and also a major, major plus for the students in our county. Thank you. And thank you. BPS, do we have anybody wishing to join us on the phone uh, regarding Senate Bill 186 and support? If you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 186, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Caroline McIntosh from Ely, Nevada. I fully support SB 186. C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E-M-C-I-N-T-O-S-H. I was born and raised in Ely, Nevada and currently live in Ely. I am a retired educator and superintendent of schools. I'm very involved in our community and serve as the chairman of the White Pine Main Street Association chairman of the White Pine Broadband Action Team, chairman of the White Pine County Tourism and Recreation Board, and member of the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation, and leader of the Boys and Girls Club in White Pine County. The Main Street Association voted unanimously in support of the passage of SB 186. The Nevada Northern Railway and its rolling stock is the cultural and tourism anchor of White Pine County. The entire complex needs to come under unified control. This fragmented situation at the complex is not working. The foundation's vision for the property contrasts significantly with the state. The foundation wants a Smithsonian Museum at the freight barn and has the staffing to make it happen. The state wants to keep using the freight barn mainly as a convention space and has no staffing to keep the freight barn open. The funding in the governor's budget is merely for repairs and not to create a museum. During the 30 years of state museums' control of the records and artifacts, nothing has been preserved or cataloged. The records are currently heaped into a building. With the passage of SB 186, the East Ely Depot Museum will continue operations in the same location. No one will lose their job. 
Thank you for your support of SB 186 to unify the Nevada Northern Railway. And thank you. BPS, anybody else wishing to join us in support? Senate Bill 186. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Glenn Taylor, G-L-E-N-N-T-A-Y-L-O-R. I am also a longtime resident of the state of Nevada, and I've been a substantial donor to the Nevada Northern Railroad Foundation. And I thank you for the opportunity to uh, give my thoughts on Senate Bill 186. This bill definitely needs to be passed, and my reasons are that I have watched the foundation grow and succeed through the years. When they asked for donation, I kicked in, and the foundation never disappoints me. I am constantly amazed at what they have been able to accomplish. They have saved the buildings from collapse, they've restored the buildings, and they've become usable again. They have rebuilt their steam locomotives, the ones that I played on as a child that were on display on Main Street, never dreaming that those engines would be on the tracks again and running. I never get enough of watching those trains. When I grew up on the railroad, it was operated by Kennecott Copper. We lived right next to the tracks. I spent many enjoyable hours in the railroad yard in East Ely. When the railroads shut down, I was de destroyed that, and distraught at the fact that they were talking about scrapping it. And I was very excited to learn that Kennecott donated it to the city of Ely and the foundation. That was one of the greatest things that White Pine County has ever had is I, that, as I testify that the greatest treasure in White Pine County is the Nevada Northern Railroad. And I'm proud to say that I've contributed substantial amounts of money to help the foundation with its many and varied projects. Returning the buildings to the city of Ely and to the foundation it is what is best for both the buildings and the best for visitors experience. I have come away several times wishing that those buildings were united into one effort to build a, a much better museum. And even myself personally have things I would love to donate to the railroad from the years and years of being uh, out on the rails and uh, even still owning property 75 miles north on the rails itself. Please return and pass this bill, 186, and help Ely build a, a greater in, economic impact and a great environment for the historic railroad societies. I thank you for this opportunity. And thank you for joining us. Next caller. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Shadrach Robertson in support of Senate Bill 186. I have seven years of public service in White Pine County as a middle school teacher. I'm a certified volunteer firefighter, an ambulance driver, and a CPR instructor. I'm a board member on the White Pine County Library, as well as the Great Basin Heritage Area Partnership. I'm also the founder of a 501c3 nonprofit organization promoting cultural arts education within the Great Basin region. I'm also the executive director of the White Pine Chamber of Commerce, and it is in that capacity that I address the Honorable Senate Committee today. As a representative of the Board of Trustees of the White Pine Chamber of Commerce, an organization that has served the Eastern Nevada region of our great state for over a century, with over 200 businesses and organizations on our registry, we unanimously and unequivocally support the transfer and return of these state held properties back to the city of Ely and the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. The East Ely Depot Museum has done very little to have any distinct presence or economic impact benefiting our city or county. However, the Nevada Northern Railway is a cornerstone to the economic well being of this city and the county. They are the number one tourist attraction in our county. They are the number one most used film industry production location 
and they are one of the largest donors to our nonprofits and community organizations. There is no greater entity more devoted to the historic preservation and the promotion of our region's history than the National Historic Landmark, the Nevada Northern Railway. The White Pine Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and I make up a socioeconomic and demographically diverse group of community leaders, and we all encourage you to support Senate Bill 186. We thank you for your time and consideration. And thank you. Next caller in support. Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to, to present. My name is Con Trumbull, C-O-N-T-R-U-M-B-U-L-L, -L, and I'm the archivist and train master of the Nevada Northern Railway. I first came to Ely uh, through a foundation program called the Be the Engineer Experience, operating one of the restored steam locomotives up and down the canyon. I came back, and I keep coming back. When given the chance to work for the foundation, I very, very quickly jumped on board bringing with me experience from 13 different museums, education centers, and archives in three different states, as well as almost 10 years of federal, manage federal records management experience and regulations through the Department of the Interior. Uh, the foundation has a very long track record of doing big things, things that people didn't think were possible, countless restoration projects, and countless new endeavors that continue to grow upon each other. Personally, I brought about the Nevada Northern Railway Archive Department. Starting with just myself, I quickly developed a program with the mission of taking our written record and providing that to the public in an easily accessible free format that gets visitors from around the globe to learn about our history. We are not just a Nevada entity. We are a nationally significant collection and a nationally significant site that time and time again is used by researchers, genealogists, and others to learn about our nation's history. As one of the writers of the State of America's Treasures Grant, I'm very proud of my team. I'm very proud of the things that we have accomplished, and I'm very proud of the plans coming ahead, including becoming a Smithsonian Affiliate Museum and being able to display our history, not just for ourselves, but to other members of the nation and of the world, all of which come here to central Nevada in the middle of the big empty see this for themselves thank you and i highly urge you to support this bill and thank you next caller please good afternoon to the committee uh, my name is michelle beecher and i am the loan officer at the rural nevada development corporation um, that is headquartered here in Ely. I'm also a former city council person for the city of Ely, as well as a former board member of the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. I'm speaking to you today in support of Senate Bill 186. I, while I do have much appreciation for Mr. Pitts and the state for the work that they've done to begin restoration on the buildings currently in their care in Ely, um, in fact, I was actually even married in the freight barn seven years ago. Um, however, it's very apparent that more can and needs to be done. Um, during my time on the foundation board, I saw the staff there take on several restoration projects. Um, with the additional manpower that they have, they really do have the ability to bring the entire railroad complex to its full potential. This is so important for the city of Ely and the economic development here and the, um, you know, our, our tourism and, and our culture. So uh, I would just urge you to, to support this bill. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Next caller, please. Public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, last call. Anyone here wishing to testify in support of Senate Bill 186? Seeing none, at this time I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 186. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. My name is Bill Martin. Here in Southern Nevada. Please continue. Well, is it that's my fine. Turn? Yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. My name is Bill Martin. I re represent the Friends of the Southern Nevada Railroad Incorporated up in Boulder City. We support the Railroad Museum in Boulder City. Uh, we uh, do not support the bill. The Friends of the Southern Nevada Railroad is a nonprofit charitable corporation that manages the membership and programs supporting the Southern Nevada Railroad in Boulder City. We have 130 volunteers and over 1,000 members that supports the museum and activities and the benefits of the state museum. It's one of the three railroad-related museums in the state system, being Carson, Ely, and Boulder City. At, a, at our meeting on March 9th, and we've actually submitted this letter to staff with the 20 copies as requested, the board approved a resolution to state our objection to Senate Bill 186 currently being considered by the Senate. We object to the bill for the following reasons. One, the state has spent money, funds to restore the buildings and there's no repayment for that investment, no consideration. The currently proposed capital budget bond fund has funds planned for additional restoration activities and has spent considerable money putting together the design specs to do that work. It has already been spent over 800,000 for that effort. The money would be lost and the planned bond funds would be diverted to other state activities so the buildings would not be restored. Nothing in the bill says that the city of foundation will do this work. The bill sets a bad precedent that a private organization could take over a state historic cultural property. What is the possible impact on this on other museums such as our Boulder City Museum or any of the other seven museums in the state system. The bill in, in, enacted provides a wrong message to any potential donor to the state museum system. The state's relationship and obligation with the donor is broken by a legislative act. Where is the trust and how is that to be kept? Transfer of the ownership does not provide a long-term guarantee of proper protection of the significant cultural resources of our state facilities such as we have now. There is a financial impact to the state because contrary to the statement in the bill summary, expenditures will be needed to be paid back and additional rental space will be needed for historic records that are currently stored in the existing buildings. We request that the Senate Bill 186 be defeated in Government Affairs Committee and not go any further in the legislative process. We know that this is the fifth attempt by the same organization to take back the assets that it and the city donated to the state in 1990. They were not able, because they were not able to care for them. On behalf of the Board of Directors of Friends of Another Nevada Summary, we sincerely thank you for hearing us and letting us speak today. By the way, I'm one of the board members and David Held here. My name is Bill Martin, last name M-A-R-T-I-N. I have over 45 years in federal and state resource, natural and culture resource management. And thank you for listening today.
and thank you for joining us. Um, if you don't mind, we'll come back to Carson City, and then we'll go back to Las Vegas, whoever wishes to go first. Good afternoon, committee members. For the record, I'm Brenda Scaleri, the Director of Tourism and Cultural Affairs. The cultural agencies within the Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs are committed to the stewardship and support of cultural resources in the public trust, to the heritage and artifacts of Nevada's history, the heritage that should be preserved for every resident and for future generations. Each of the seven museums within the Division of Museums and History is a home for the artifacts of history that anchor Nevada's present to its storied past, artifacts that bring those stories to life and give character, character to our origins as a Western state. For 30 years, the state held historic buildings in Ely have been a part of that family of museums that belong to every Nevadan. Like our state parks and recreation areas, it has been a rest restored and preserved for and by the people of Nevada. These historic buildings represent a special piece of history in Eastern Nevada, preserved for every student, family, and visitor to experience. This bill proposes removing the buildings from the public trust and placing them under the management of a private foundation. In doing so, this may set a legal pre precedent for the disposal of Nevada's resources cared for in the public trust and the preservation of fewer historic places for the benefit of all Nevadans. My testimony is in opposition, and I ask this committee to consider how their decision may change the mission of the Division of Museums and History and the future of Nevada's public cultural resources. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, anyone wishing to go next here in Carson City? Through the Honorable Chair of the Senate Government Affairs Committee to all committee members, Thank you for this opportunity to address the matter of SB 186. SB 186 proposes to transfer the state's East Ely Railroad Depot's historic assets to a private entity. This would be unprecedented. East Ely Railroad Depot Museum is one of seven state museums. The passenger depot and the freight building is the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum. The building's I'm sorry to cut you off. I just want to make sure that we identify for the record. Myron Friedman. Thank you, please. Thank administrator you. for the Division of Museums and History. Continue. The passenger depot and the freight building is the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum. The buildings belong to the people of Nevada. Time stands still in Ely. The East Ely Depot, built in 1905, stands sentinel over the vast Nevada Northern Railway yards that moved people, goods, and most especially the copper ores that electrified America during the Great American Century. East Ely Depot and Freight Barn belong to Nevadans. The historic buildings were deeded to the state in 1990. The legislature established the museum in 1991 for the people of Nevada. The buildings were restored with state funds and operate as the only state museum in eastern Nevada. To preserve our heritage out there, NRS 381-004 created the state museum in Ely. NRS 381-006 provides for the control and management of the state's museum buildings by the Division of Museums and History. For over 30 years, Nevada has preserved the East Ely Depot and Freight Barn, engaging Nevadans in a priceless historic resource. This museum is a fully funded state agency with 2.5 full-time employees. Museum Director Sean Pitts is the go-to historian for White Pine County and a state employee for 30 plus years. The people of Nevada saved two historic treasures. The freight building was in a near collapsed condition before Nevada saved it. You can see in the picture there, this is how the state received the building when, back in the uh, early 90s. Nevada restored the foundation, the roof, the walkways, the structure, the siding, the floor, the plumbing, the electrical, and preserved the evidence of its, of its historic use. Constructed in 1905, the freight barn is the oldest structure on the site. Businesses like the Hotel Nevada marked their holding areas by inscribing their names on the walls of the interior. The museum staff preserves and interprets this history for visitors and school students who learn the history of Ely, White Pine County, and mining and railroading in eastern Nevada. The state invests and preserves for all Nevadans. Between 1990 and today, Nevada has invested over $4 million in preserving and maintaining these state-owned state historic structures. Beginning in the 1990s, museum professionals from across the state came to Ely to work on rehousing the archives of the Nevada Northern Railway. The records were deeded to the state. 
Inside the state-owned depot building, the museum houses and provides access to the frequently requested archival materials. The depot is a library, it's an archive, and it's a museum exhibit. The original offices, furniture, and everyday business artifacts date back to 1906. In 2023, the East Ely Depot Railroad Museum will be shovel ready to remodel the historic freight barn. An additional investment of almost $1 million is going into design and construction plans. Museum staff invited the community to engage in the planning. The historic facility will be insulated, sprinkled, HVAC put in, and improved for year-round use as a venue for cultural programs, conventions, weddings, parties, business meetings, and as a museum. The two CIP projects totaling $8.5 million will continue the state's program to further restore these buildings. $825,000 to restore the depot foundation and $7.7 .7 million for construction to turn the freight barn into a year-round museum, event venue, and research center. In addition to managing the museum, staff provide outreach to White Pine County students and school tours of the museum. The museum uses the freight barn for programs. The program opportunities will greatly expand when the building renovation is complete and it will be available year-round for bookings. The State Museum is part of the Nevada Northern Railway site. The site and trains are operated by the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. The depot and freight barn are operated by the state. The freight barn, pictured on the right with the white roof, shows the investment made by the state to preserve the building. The large building in the rear belongs to the foundation. As you can see, it is in great need of restoration. Over the years, the two entities entered into several agreements to coordinate operating on the same site. The foundation ended the agreements. The state continued to reach out with new terms. The state provided ADA accessible restrooms in the depot. The foundation uses them for storage, preventing their intended use. The state seeks to have a cooperative relationship with the foundation. Much of the state's archive is kept in a building owned by the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation. When their building leaked, the museum was not alerted and some of the state's property was damaged. The state seeks to have a cooperative relationship with the foundation. The Division of Museums and History and the Division of State Lands have reached out multiple times to establish a cooperative agreement with the foundation. This coming biennium will be an exciting chapter for the East Ely Railroad Museum as we continue to invest in these historic assets that belong to the people of Nevada. Our vision is for a productive and cooperative par partnership between the museum and the foundation to benefit the visitors and all Nevadans, and we will continue to pursue this goal. Thank you. And thank you, please. Senators, thank you for your time. My name is Sean Pitts. I'm the director of the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum for the past 32 years, and I'm here to present information about Senate Bill 186, an unprecedented move that would give away a functioning state museum currently held in public trust to another entity. It is unnecessary since we're a complementary organization, not a competing organization. The two buildings that make up the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum were deeded to the state when the city of Ely and the foundation and White Pine County determined they would not be able to maintain them. The state accepted these historic structures and committed to maintain them for the benefit of all Nevadans something that we have done for more than three decades. Capital improvement plans in a governor's recommended budget will establish the museum in the freight building and make it the go-to place for visitors and residents of Eastern Nevada to find out about their past, to discover it, and to engage with it. Like every state museum, the East Ely Railroad Depot Museum meets the definition of a museum which is, and I quote from the American, Alliance of Associate, the American Alliance of Museums, quote, an organization educational in purpose who owns, cares for, and exhibits artifacts to the public on a regular basis. Like every state museum, the East Dealey Railroad Depot Museum holds to the highest standards of professional museum work within its mission. We collect the artifacts of Eastern Nevada that show our industrial heritage. We preserve these artifacts, including the two historic buildings that have been entrusted to us in perpetuity. As a public entity, our collections, our financial operations are entirely open and transparent to public scrutiny, and collections are always available to the public. 
The two state buildings in East, at the East Dealey Railroad Depot Museum are necessary to fulfill this mission. We cannot continue to collect or preserve without the buildings that we have. We cannot preserve our archival collection without the space in the buildings to process these valuable artifacts and archives. We cannot continue our restoration of these 115-year-old buildings without the space that we currently occupy and utilize. And most regrettably, we cannot continue to educate on a level that we have maintained for more than 30 years. We have provided educational programming to every classroom who requests it through our outreach and through our in-house educational programs. Every single one of these programs is at no cost to the school, the teacher, or the class. Every single program has been developed with the teacher's curriculum to provide an enhanced educational experience for the students of Nevada. We provide similar programs to any high school, college level, or lifelong or learning organization that requests it. Our collections have provided hundreds of Nevadans proof of residency in order to receive downwinder payments after above ground nuclear testing in the 1950s. Our staff research provided the document that proved Japanese Americans were unfairly relocated at the beginning of World War II. That document led to the reparations of their families and the righting of a 60 year old wrong. The East Ely Railroad Depot Museum is a functioning museum. It operates at the highest standards. SB 186 makes it far more difficult for our staff to do the job which this legislature and this state has entrusted us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll go to Las Vegas. Hello and thank you. My name is David Held and I'm speaking in opposition of uh, Senate Bill 186. The state buildings in Ely should remain in possession of the state due to the significant investment the state has already made in their preservation and maintenance. The state has dedicated a considerable amount of funds and resources to ensure the upkeep of these buildings, and it is essential to continue the effort to ensure their long-term preservation. Additionally, the financial capacity of Ely is currently unknown as their books have been closed since 2020 and may not be enough to handle the cost of maintaining these buildings without the support of the state. They asked the state to take the buildings over in the past, which is how the state received the possession to begin with when Ely was not financially able to do it. If Ely were to take over ownership of the buildings, there would not be a safety net if Ely were to be hit by hard times in the future. By having the partnership with the state, it opens more possibilities for grants and other funding opportunities. Therefore, it is essential to maintain state ownership of these buildings to ensure their continued preservation uh, and maintenance of this national landmark for the benefit of community and future generations. Thank you. And thank you. Is there anybody else in Las Vegas? I wanted to make sure we, we captured everybody there. No, that's it as far as in the room. Thank you. And we'll come back to Carson City, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Government Affairs Committee, and we appreciate you taking time for us. My name is Dan Thielen. I'm the director of the Nevada State Railroad Museum. I'm a uh, retired veteran of the uh, Army. And in, in my service in the Army, I ran the Construction Facilities Management Office for the Nevada National Guard, building three buildings, throughout Nevada and, and maintaining and restoring other buildings for the state of, the, of Nevada. I have a lot of experience in this and I've been a director now for about six or seven years and um, in that time um, have watched what the state has done and I understand what the program is. The state's invested over four and a half million dollars in the, the facilities in East Ely in the freight barn on behalf of the people of Nevada. Um, so that they can have access to their history. Historic preservation is tough work. It takes thought, it, it's thoughtful and requires professionals. It requires oversight, it requires time. The best work is not done in haste. The best work does not look for the least restrictive codes to follow or the cheapest alternative. The goal for the state is to preserve the history for generations for the people of Nevada. The state has made the best decisions to that end. We have not sold historic fabric to sustain operations. We do not compromise in preserving history. Over 30 years, these four and a half million in investments in two buildings average about $50,000 a year per building. The high, they represent the highest standards of care in the industry. This averages, this, these are the best preserved buildings on the site. And it's no wonder, the project 
projects were supervised by the Nevada State Public Works Board in close in close oversight with the State Historic Preservation Office. The spending is specific, the records are open, the product is amazing. It's no wonder the foundation wants them, but they're just two buildings. The state doesn't have to worry about 30 miles of track, 50 other buildings, or the switches, the culverts, the crossings, or all those to upgrade. The foundation will tell you that they have spent $39 million in the, in the past 30 years. When you sprinkle that across 60 buildings, they're averaging about 22,000 per year, less than half of what the state's invested in their building and buildings and the state's main, or the foundation is operating locomotives that need maintenance and crossings and rail and right of way. Their investment should probably be 60 million to 100 million to, to be on par with what the state has spent out there. Um, if they could invest that kind of money, they would have invested that kind of money. The McGill Depot would be open to the public. The paint building would be not in disrespair, disrepair. The foundry and forge would be open. By the next biennium, the state will invest another eight and a half million in the two facilities. The state will provide a safe sprinkler four season facilities for the citizens of the state. The state will provide a collection storage area for and a curation space. The state will provide an archive for the people, for their children, for their children's children. The state has always been committed to this museum and to the people of the state of Nevada. Thank you for your time. And thank you. Please welcome. Thank you, Chair Flores, Senators of the Committee. Good afternoon. For the record, I'm Dr. Christopher McMahon. I am the museum director for the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Boulder City and adjunct professor of history at Nevada State College. An artifact is defined as an object made by a human being, typically an item of historical or cultural interest. Humans create objects large and small, and the East Ely Depot Museum houses artifacts of all sizes. The two largest artifacts interpreted by the museum are the depot and freight barn themselves. These structures are objects made by Nevadans, demonstrating the varied lives and cultures of the myriad people who lived in eastern Nevada, allowing visitors to the structures to step back in time and reflect on those who came before. Artifacts held in the public trust are at the heart of SB 186, artifacts whose history and heritage were deemed so significant, the state of Nevada agreed to take custody of these structures and preserve them in perpetuity. They did this as a museum for the education and enrichment of all Nevadans. By statute, the state museums, including the East Ely Depot Museum, are required to receive, collect, care for, and interpret property, and that is exactly what the museum has done with the East Ely Depot and Freight Barn. Now, this body, considering SB 186, is being asked to take the unprecedented step of transferring these artifacts and historic landmarks out of the public trust. And once this is done, this Pandora's box cannot be closed. I ask you now to consider what ramifications beyond Ely this would incur. What would you give away next? Would it be the ship's bell and silver collection of the USS Nevada? The exquisite baskets of Dot Solali? Or would you even give away the Nevada Constitution itself? All these items are artifacts held in the public trust by Nevadans for Nevadans. The East Ely Depot and Freight Barn are no different. In closing, I ask the committee to reflect on the words of John Adams. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. Fact, the East Ely Depot and Freight Barn are by definition artifacts. What is SB 186? Fact, this is a bill that proposes transferring Nevada's history, Nevada's culture, and Nevada's heritage held by the people, for the people, to a private entity for their own enrichment and gain. Thank you. And thank you. Please, welcome. Did you hear that? If you can do it one more time, please. Okay. My name is Dr. Doris Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R. I'm a resident of Fallon. I'm a board member, long-standing 12-year board member of the Division of Museums and History. 
Um, I'm a professional historian, reti retired professor emeritus at Western Nevada College of, of History and Humanities. <clears throat> As a professional historian, I'm particularly concerned about the state this, and the status of the archives at the East Ely Depot. As you know, the archives of the Northern Nevada Company, you know, railway company, was, it does belong to the state of Nevada. They are housed in a vault. I've been there twice to examine them. They belong to a vault. Uh, they are housed in a vault that belong to the foundation. And as you know from the handout with which you were provided, there was, there's been weather damage. It's not temperature controlled. These are very, very fragile documents from the late 18 and early 1900s, and they cannot, they cannot survive in that environment. Now, in the planned renovation of the freight building, um, the $7.7 .7 million that uh, recommended in the governor's budget for this year, it includes temperature-controlled archival quality storage for these documents. It would be a shame if we couldn't proceed with that planned renovation, if for that, for the uh, archival material alone. Secondly, I'd, I'd like to, I, I was very happy to hear the unanimous comments of the value of Sean Pitts to the community of East Ely. He is a unique historical resource that is well documented by all sides uh, on this issue. He is um, uniquely qualified to direct uh, who can have access. As a public institution, historical documents have to be available, have to be publicly owned for people to have true access, for research to have true access to that. And given the many kind comments about uh, Mr. Pitts, um, I think it strains credulity for a bill, a proposed bill, that would turn over the two state buildings to a private entity and lease back one floor of one building to the state to run as a museum. I think it strains credulity to say that those jobs are not in jeopardy in the future. As a private citizen and taxpayer um, of Nevada, um, I'm concerned that the millions of dollars, four millions and counting, of state money that has already been invested in this would be turned over to an entity that might not be in, uh, that might not be in a position to continue that kind of support. Now, I've been on the train ride, and the, the train ride is a wonderful, wonderful experience, as some of you know. The only downside to the train ride is when you're going in and out of the property, you see a lot of dilapidated buildings that didn't really show up on that, on that diagram that was shown, and the, 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 the uh, foundation used the figure of 60 structures that they were given control of. The great majority of those are in disrepair, and if should someone get on that property, would be a safety a safety hazard. So, um, uh, I'm I'm not sure as a citizen of Nevada, I would like that I would like to see the those two state buildings turned over to a private entity. Um, the foundation has been in existence since 1984, and still the great majority of the buildings over which they have control are piles of rubble that are readily visible from, from the wonderful train ride that they, that they have. The first two, three structures that you see when you arrive at the property give the first impressions to visitors. Two of those three buildings belong to the state. That is the first impression that visitors have, and it's a very good impression. And I would like to see the state retain control of the, those two buildings. Lastly, I was very disappointed as the chairman of the East Ely Committee on the Board of Museums and History of the many times that we have reached out, the last being in this February, an attempt at mediation in East in Ely uh, in which there was no response 
when we reached out with a proposal, no response from the foundation, when we were going through proper channels and we just didn't get very far. So thank you very much for allowing me to make these comments. We have very little time left. I, I, I think we have about two minutes. I am saying that only to make it clear that it, I, I see there's a f about four of us. It might be a good idea that you just get your name on the record, who you are, and, and not share testimony, uh, unless one of you wants to take up the entire time. But, but you have about two minutes left, and we still haven't heard from anyone wishing to join us over the phone. Um, so whoever wishes to go first. My name is Todd Moore. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees of the Friends of the Nevada State Railroad Museum. And our organization is opposed to SB 186. And it's opposed for one important reason. When the public trust in this property is violated, it makes it enormously more difficult for us to raise money to backfill the needs of the state's three railroad museums. Because we have to tell our potential donors that in the state of Nevada, if someone is able to hire a lobbyist and come to the legislature, they can transfer property to a private entity even when it's against the recommendation of the state's professional historic staff. And that is a huge problem and it's one that we'll never be able to overcome if this bill passes. Thank you. Thank you. Please. My name is Barry Simcoe and I'm the past president of the Friends of the Nevada State Railroad Museum. Um, 80 years old, I've seen a lot of stuff go away over the years. The museums have done a great job of keeping these treasures. I don't believe that it makes sense to transfer from the museum system to a private entity. Thank you. Please, welcome. Hi, my name is Sam Flakus, and I'm a uh, member of the um, uh, Friends of the Nevada State uh, Railroad Museum. And I'm also a board member of the uh, Carson City Cultural Commission. And I just want to make the parallel that, um, that Carson City wishes we had a lot of the things that Ely has. We don't have our beloved engine house anymore. Um, we wish it was uh, that we had gotten the same kind of treatment of acquiring that building that Ely had gotten. Um, and now we don't have it. So that's, that's the difference between um, uh, what's happening with, um, you know, should it belong to the state or shouldn't it? Um, as I, if it doesn't belong to the state, it doesn't get saved. That's kind of, the, of what happens um, here in Nevada. Ashton? My name is Ashton Flakus, and uh, this is my dad. So he's, what's your position? They already know my position. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I think that we shouldn't uh, pass this bill because we've already lost a lot of historical landmark, like landmark, not really like landmarks, but um, a lot of history, just kind of in general. So I think we should probably try to preserve at least something, and that's what I have to say. And I really appreciate you joining us, and you close us out. Um, however, in the interest of giving an opportunity for those who wish to at least be acknowledged, unfortunately, we can't take any more testimony. We've exceeded the 30 minutes that we've allotted. Um, if you wanted to speak today, you have not had an opportunity to do so in opposition. If you could just please rise so we can acknowledge you. I understand that you've, is there anybody else? I do see three, uh, four. Uh, just to let the record reflect that in Carson City, unfortunately, because uh, due to time restraints, we had four individuals that weren't able to provide their testimony. I want to remind you that you have an opportunity to submit anything in writing to our staff, and we'll make sure it gets uploaded and that your remarks are uh, marked as in opposition and that your testimony can be reviewed by the committee. Thank you for joining us, and to, to you, thank you. We always appreciate when we have future legislators who come in here and hang out with us. So thank you for joining us. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in the neutral position for Senate Bill 186. Anybody in Carson City or Las Vegas wishing to testify in neutral? Seeing none, BPS, do we have anybody on the phone? If you would like to testify in neutral for SB 186, 
Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time, Chair. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we'll close out uh, neutral and any closing remarks you may have. Welcome back. Thank you, uh, Chairman Flores. Um, a lot was said about um, the public trust and how this bill somehow violates the public trust. What this bill does is it does not transfer the two buildings to a private entity. It transfers the building to the city of Ely and a nonprofit. This distinction matters. Facts matter. So let's all take a pause when we talk about the public trust. The city of Ely is a political subdivision of the state. The public trust is still protected under this bill. This does not violate any public trust. This bill specifically states that it must, the transfer must include restrictions that protect all historical and recreational value of the real property, guarantee public access, and prohibit the city of Ely and the Nevada Northern Railway Foundation from selling, leasing, encumbering, alienating, or otherwise disposing without a concurrent resolution of the legislature. So when we talk about public trust, the city of Ely, we're talking about preserving this. This is what this bill does. It preserves these buildings. It allows the city of Ely and the foundation to jointly own them and invest the necessary money and into the rehabilitation of the freight barn. The CIP money that's been requested is just that. It is a request. It has not been funded. The state has not been, been given those dollars. What we could do as a solution to this, if this bill were to pass, it is up to the legislature to decide what those dollars, the CIP, go to. There are over 40 requests, 40 currently requested CIPs, over $40 million that the museum system needs. That $9.5 million can go to Boulder City. It can go to Carson City. So if you're friends of Boulder City, if you're friends of Carson City, this bill helps you. Ms. Ms. Dwyer said that we participated in mediation and that there was no response. I don't know what she's talking about. We spent three days trying to mediate. It failed. We could not come to an agreement, but we were there. We were participating for two and a half days. So I don't know what she's talking about when we said there's been no response. We've been actively trying to resolve this issue, but we're here. We couldn't mediate. Now we're here. This is the best solution moving forward. It preserves the foundation or it preserves the museum on the second floor. If this bill were to pass tomorrow, Friday, the operations remain exactly the same in Ely for the state. It remains on the second floor, just as it is today, as a state museum. No one is losing their job. None of the history is lost. The foundation and the city of Ely, their entire goal and intent and mission is preserving and protecting the historical integrity of this National Historic Landmark. Senator Guaycachia. Uh, thank you. I want to thank the committee for a lengthy hearing. We knew it would be, uh, you know, at least controversial. I do feel a comfort level, like I say, a couple of points I want to again bring forward. This was given by the city of Ely to the state at no cost. I have a comfort level with the reversionary clause in there. If they don't protect it, if they, in fact, don't remove some of that property and it without a concurrent resolution from the legislature, again, it reverts to the state. So I have a comfort level with that. The other thing is, I truly believe that the people, and I think most of the testimony verified that, the people in Ely really want to see a change and a move. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And thank you both. And I also let the record reflect that I think we all received numerous letters and emails, both in support and opposition. And again, I'm, I'm appreciative of so many people engaging in this conversation. With that, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 186. 
And lastly, invite folk to join us for public comment. I want to remind folk public comment is not a time to revisit any bill. It is a time for you to speak about general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. Um, would anybody like to join us for public comment? Either Carson City or Las Vegas. Seeing none, BPS, we have anybody wishing to join us on the phone? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind folk that we will not be meeting this Friday, so you can plan accordingly and make arrangements with your family as that's important. Uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.